Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at another high-performance mini PC. This one is coming from Minis Forum. This is their Elite Mini UM780, and it is powered by a Ryzen 7840HS processor. It does pretty well in some areas, but not in others. And we're gonna take a closer look at what this little mini PC is all about in just a second. But I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in free of charge from the manufacturer. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this mini PC is all about. Now the price point on this one at the moment is $623 as configured, but they often run promotions that bring the price down. So shop around a bit on it. I also think there is a bare bones version of this that does not have storage or memory. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, this unit has a Ryzen 7840HS processor, an eight core chip. You'll see it performs quite well for gaming and other tasks. It has 32 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM. And a little bit earlier, we did a teardown of the unit to see what was inside. The top layer there comes off just with a magnet, but you do have to unscrew the light that I'll show you in a second that's on the top. And underneath there, you can see we've got crucial RAM and a Kingston SSD, and there are uh, two RAM sticks in there. So this one has two 16 gigabyte DDR5 sticks. You can bring this up to 64 gigabytes if you want, and you definitely wanna do that in pairs to get the dual channel memory going on. Now, if you look below the NVMe, you'll see there's a second NVMe slot in there. Both of these slots are PCI Express 4, and you could add a second hard drive if you want, but this also supports OcuLink, which is a way of connecting external devices to the PCI Express bus. And there is a port here above the HDMI, and in the box you will find this little adapter card that will slide into that second NVMe slot and align with this port. OcuLink is being used for external GPUs and other PCI Express devices because it connects directly to the bus and might be a little more efficient than USB 4 or Thunderbolt, especially for external GPUs. And we'll talk a little bit about the USB 4 performance on here, so you may want to figure out a way to make use of that slot if you want to add a GPU to it in the future. Now, while we're on the back here, we may as well look at the ports. Here we've got two USB-A ports. Both of these are 3.2 Gen 2 ports. They run at 10 gigabits per second. You have a display port out. You have your HDMI out here. You've got the OcuLink that we mentioned earlier. You also have dual 2.5 gigabit ethernet. And right now I have the machine connected to my multi-gigabit network. And if we jump over to my speed test app here, you can see how those ethernet ports perform. And in my testing, they seem to give me the full bandwidth here that I would expect. So we're getting 2.3 here on the downstream and accounting for overhead, that is pretty good. And you'll see the upstream here in a second when it cycles the test. And what's nice is that you have two of these ethernet ports. These are real tech ports in case you're wondering for Linux compatibility and the performance here looks pretty good on those. It also has killer Wi-Fi. Unfortunately though, the Wi-Fi does not perform as well. I ran a test a little bit earlier and I could not get the Wi-Fi to perform where most of my other Wi-Fi 6 devices perform down here. So as you can see, we're dropping off quite a bit. It then rallies and kind of pumps back up again, but I could not crack about 400 megabits per second on the downstream. Typically, I get over 700 megabits per second off my Wi-Fi 6 access point down here. I did try to adjust some of the killer Wi-Fi features in the control panel. I could not get a better score than what you just saw there. So unfortunately, the Wi-Fi performance is a bit off, but the Ethernet here feels just fine. Now, unlike some of the other mini PCs we've tested recently, you cannot power this over the USB port. You do need to use the included power supply. It's actually a pretty nice little power supply here, 120 watts in a very small form factor. And this of course sits separate from the computer. The TDP on this for the processor is 65 watts by default, and you can switch it up to 70 watts through the performance mode setting in the BIOS. And that's what I set mine to for this review. And as you'll see in a few minutes, the processor performance is quite nice on here. 
On the front, you've got two more of these USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, another USB 4 port, a reset button, a headphone microphone jack here, and then of course your power button, and that is it. Now on the top here, you'll notice we've got this Tiger getting projected through the top of the case, and if we pop this off here real quick, it's held on by magnets, you'll see there's just a big diffused LED light here, and you can actually take this thing out and replace it with something else. So if I pop it out here, you'll see that it's just a solid color. And apparently you could probably make your own. They did offer to send me a custom one, but I declined that offer. So there's possibilities to maybe customize the look here a little bit. You can turn this off if you don't like it through the BIOS though, if it's bothering you. Now, as far as mounting is concerned, they do give you a Visa mount in the box so you can mount it on the back of a monitor. They also give you a stand that will allow this to sit off of the table kind of at an angle. Looks pretty cool, but I think it works just fine flat here on the desk too, but it's nice to have some mounting options. So now let's talk about the USB 4 ports. As you saw, there's a USB 4 port here on the front and another on the back. These do support video output, so you can get a total of four displays connected simultaneously, two through the USB 4 ports, and then one through the display port and another one through the HDMI. These are rated to be 40 gigabit USB 4 ports, so they should be compatible with Thunderbolt devices like this external hard drive that I have here. This is a Samsung X5, and I've got my Thunderbolt cable connected to it. Unfortunately, when I run a speed test on this, even with write caching enabled, I'm not getting the performance that I should get out of this drive. So although 1.7 gigabytes per second out of a portable drive is pretty good. This drive on the reads should be giving us 2.5 gigabytes per second on the reads and around two gigabytes per second on the writes, and it's just not getting there with these ports. So I think we're not quite getting the performance that we should out of a 40 gigabit per second USB 4 port. So while the USB and the Wi-Fi don't perform as well as I would like, there are some things to like about this machine's performance. First is the speed of that internal SSD we looked at earlier. As you can see here on my little Blackmagic speed test, we're getting 3.3 gigabytes per second on writes and 3.6 gigabytes per second on reads. And that's with only one drive installed. You could go RAID 0 and have two drives working in tandem and get even better performance out of it. So I was very pleased with the speed of the reads and writes here on the internal drive. It's also more than adequate for basic business tasks. So if you're doing a lot of stuff in a web browser throughout the day, like QuickBooks and other web applications, this is gonna be fine. As you can see here, browsing the web, everything is super fast and responsive here as we browse the nasa.gov homepage. So all that basic business stuff is going to be just fine here, if not maybe even a little bit of overkill given the fact that there are less expensive mini PCs that perform equally well. Also of note here, I'm running this display at 4K 60. A little bit earlier, I also booted up some YouTube video. This is a 4K 60 frames per second video from my extras channel. It did drop a couple of frames here and there, nothing all that noticeable, and playback was just fine for streaming video. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 404, and that puts this machine pretty much at the top of the list for web browsing performance. Now I booted up DaVinci Resolve a little bit earlier to see how it handles 4K 60 frames per second video editing. It actually did pretty well here. As you can see, that transition rendered without any lag in real time. I was able to drop in another one here and it also did quite well. So if you're doing basic video editing, the kinds of stuff that I do here on this channel, this actually is going to be just fine for that. What's nice about this machine is that you do have the option to add in an external GPU, which would allow you to do much higher end video editing with that separate graphics processor. And that's one great use case for that Oculink port on board. Now, as far as gaming is concerned, it did quite well. The processor inside of this is very similar to the new Z1 processor that we're seeing on some of the PC handhelds from Lenovo and from Asus. So we're getting very similar performance out of it. So this is Red Dead Redemption 2. We were running this at 1080p at the lowest settings. And I was getting between 55 and 60 frames per second. It was mostly hovering in the 55 frames per second territory, but of course, certainly very playable. And if you don't mind dropping down to 30 frames per second, you could actually boost up the visual quality on it. 
So this game ran quite nicely. You do see a little screen tearing there. That's because I capture at only 30 frames per second. We also ran Doom Eternal. This also ran very nicely. This game usually runs pretty quick as is. 1080p at the lowest settings, we were getting around 85 frames per second, give or take, which is great. It did drop down in some areas, but mostly it was above 60, so a very good Doom Eternal experience. And then, of course, we have No Man's Sky. This was running at 1080p at the lowest settings. They call those standard settings in this game. And here we were getting about 70 to 75 frames per second. This game does vary up quite a bit, given the fact that it's all procedurally generated and it's got scenes on the ground, scenes in space, but overall a very playable experience here with those lower settings. So this is a pretty decent little gaming machine, and I would put its performance kind of close to what you might get out of an Xbox Series S. You're not going to get a lot of detail in the graphics at high frame rates, but the games that you do play on it are quite playable. I do think some of the newer games that are coming out now, like Starfield, are going to be a little bit harder to run on these devices, but there's a vast library of games that should run quite nicely on here, including a lot of what you'll find on Microsoft Game Pass. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 3,197. That puts this machine pretty much in line with what we saw out of the similarly equipped B-Link SER7. So all in, it's performing as expected. You can also see how this stacks up against the Lenovo Legion Go that has one of those AMD Z1 Extreme processors. Also of note is the Lenovo Legion there at the bottom. This was a 15-inch gaming laptop with a 1050 Ti GPU that I reviewed just a few years ago. So it's pretty amazing what we're able to get now out of a single chip on a mini PC. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a passing grade of 98% which means that you won't see all that much of a performance drop off when the computer is placed under heavy load for a sustained period of time. It does, of course, have a cooling fan on board, but it is rather large and you don't hear it all that much. It won't come on at all when you're just running your web browser or sitting idle at your desktop here. When a game is running, you certainly hear the fan a little bit, but it's not a wind tunnel. It's actually a pretty quiet fan, all things considered. So it does handle its thermals quite nicely. And a little bit earlier, we tested some Linux on it with the latest version of Ubuntu, and all of the hardware was detected properly. That includes the audio, the display, the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, and of course the Ethernet. And all in, it was a very nice Linux experience here in addition to what we experienced on Windows. So you do have some flexibility in operating systems, and it's nice that you've got two hard drive slots inside essentially that you could use to have different operating systems running. So altogether, a pretty nicely performing machine here. I do hope they maybe can figure out a BIOS update or something that can improve its USB and Wi-Fi performance. But beyond that, it is a nicely performing Ryzen Mini PC. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the new year brings because we're starting to see a lot more of these high performers out there that are not all that expensive comparatively. That's gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, Brian Parker, Budley, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Steve Green, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.